between Christmas and New Year's, I'll also be doing that one. I was thinking maybe I should just hold it. <laughs> that brand bag will be on true crime and uh, also kind of a tutorial on how to use newspapers.com. So that's December 28th. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, like I say, thanks again for coming. And today we're going to talk about the Black Rock Mine. And um, as you can see from this photo here, it was a pretty enormous operation. And to me, one of the startling things is uh, that there is no trace of this mine left today okay. in the mining landscape. Not one building remains. Um, I haven't personally been to the site, you know, physically where it once stood, but at least from the maps that we have put together, which I'll show you in this presentation, there is, there's no remnant of this mine. And um, so just a bit of a disclaimer, it's always kind of intimidating to talk to a group at a brown bag at the Butte Archives, especially when you're not from Butte. Um, inevitably, people in this room know more than I do about just about any subject. Um, that's, that said, this uh, exhibit that you see out here in the lobby was really my first research project as a new employee of the archives. I've worked here since July. And um, so I did, I think, learn a lot about this operation and its history and its legacy um, in the course of doing all that research. So I hope to be able to share something, uh, new information with you. But, uh, and there will be time at the end if folks have, you know, anecdotes or questions or comments you'd like to add. Hi, how are you? Um, so anyway, that's how we go ahead and proceed. So the Black Rock Mine, this is a pretty um, compelling photo uh, that is on display in the exhibit as well in the lobby. And um, so we'll talk first about where it was. So yeah, where was the Black Rock Mine? This is another angle. This is kind of a southeast facing angle. And in this picture, you can see the big concentrator building right here. That was one of the things really that differentiated the Black Rock from other mines of the mm -hmm. time, that uh, they built their own mill and concentrator. They had primary, secondary pressures, flotation <coughs> units. And uh, it was a, a full on operation from, you know, blasting, mucking, hoisting, crushing, flotation, and shipping zinc concentrates. And uh, so where was it? This is a map that we put together, and this is on display out in the lobby too. Um, and so there, the building uh, layout is kind of superimposed over the current day mining landscape. And there you can see, here's Walkerville, there's my house. And, um, and there's where the Black Rock was. So where it is today is basically the southwest shore of the Yankee Doodle Tailings Pond. And this is a 1947 aerial photograph that fades into present day. A couple things to note on this photograph, or on this uh, overlay. So the Black Rock would have been here, and you can kind of see some remnants, some impact of it. But I also like to look down here where you can see all the neighborhoods disappear into the pit. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, so then this, this one details the layout of the buildings on top of the topography and the actual vein underground, what they were mining. And there was pretty extensive litigation between the Butte and Superior Company, which owned the Black Rock Mine, and then the Elmore Lou Company, um, that mine there, the veins, basically intersected. And, and there was, like I say, extensive litigation that resulted in a loss for the Black Rock Mine Company. Um, they ended up having to pay substantial fines and fees, not only for encroaching on the adjacent mine's claim, but for them fixing it in their books in such a way that they still made money on the lawsuit. <laughs> so they got fine for that. Um, so yeah, this is that 1947 overlay showing you kind of the, the uh, former site of the Black Rock, which by that time had been dismantled. Okay, so there's that map. So what did it look like? Um, these series of pictures that we have um, that are on display in the exhibit that I'm showing you here, um, come from Clemente Leva, who was a photographer, and I'll talk a little bit about him towards the end. But uh, these pictures that we have of the Black Rock, uh, most of them are the winter of 1911 into 1912, and that's when they were constructing the concentrator building and really expanding the mine. It was this massive expansion of the operation uh, that was several million dollars at the time. And just an enormous investment in infrastructure process, 
all the uh, minerals that they were hoisting up from underground. So this is the, uh, the carpenters at work here. It's kind of hard to see unless you can really zoom in on it. So I encourage you to walk through the lobby if you haven't already and really take a look closely at these photos. And uh, we scanned all these from the original glass plate negatives, which are 8 by 10 inch negatives. And um, if you scan them at 800 dpi, you can zoom in and see whiskers on the faces <laughs> of, these, of these guys. So I love how they're just standing here. You know, no harnesses, uh, no OSHA inspector, I imagine. But, um, and if we'll look at the Sanborn map in a little bit. And the top end of this building was like 45 feet off the ground. And so these guys are just hanging out there posing for the photo. And it's kind of uh, remarkable, the more you look at these photos, the more you kind of understand uh, the, the sheer size of the structure that they're building. And these timbers, I mean, you just can't get lumber like this these days. But And this guy here is kind of dangling off the side, standing on a rope. Um, and uh, you know, they're just workmen busy about every portion of the job site. Putting together this enormous building for the concentrator and mill, and so this is the photo that was on the, the first slide, and uh, this is an east-facing photo. I'm suspecting that Leva took this from a nearby head frame, otherwise maybe he rented a hot air balloon. <laughs> I'm sure. My guess is the maybe the Elmore Lou he took it from that head frame, um, but it's kind of hard to determine. But so in this picture, a couple notable things: the timber. Uh, all the timber slides that were north of the head frame here and just the massive amount of timber that they went through. I have a little fact sheet coming up in a minute. We'll talk about a couple quick numbers on the mine, but just uh, I'll mention ahead of time that they went through about a million board feet a month. And so that would be like a you know 10 by 12 board stretched end to end from here to St. Regis. And they would go through that amount of timber every single month. And uh, the lifespan of this mine was roughly 1880 to 1930. And it didn't really get going until prior to World War I, like 1909 through World War I was really the heyday of this mine. So that million board feet a month figure, I think, is really for kind of a limited period, still a staggering amount of work going into this operation. And um, like I say, when we look at the Sandborn maps, we'll kind of go over what each of these buildings are. And it's a little bit um, confusing because this mine expanded so rapidly and then was so quickly uh, dismantled and sold off that it's hard to track in the photos even year to year because Leva went up there a later period too. Um, you know, what buildings are where is just a massive sprawling operation built into this craggy hillside. So, um, but yeah, you can see here, so they had um, steam heat all throughout this facility with a coal-fired fire, boiler. And so I assume that's the, the coal there being burned for heat on site. Um, and then this is the gallus frame number three, which was <coughs> later moved to the Anselmo. So they had three shafts at this mine by the time it was said and done. Another great picture of the construction, and so uh, I think in the newspaper the caption said they were building a head frame here, but in fact this is the secondary crusher tower. And so you can kind of see below, if you look closely, or in the corner, these are big steel clad sides that lead up uh, to this tower, and where this young man is standing on a plank um, that's being held in place by a rope, uh, this is where a covered runway was that would bring the ore from the primary crusher on the covered tram to the top of this tower, the secondary crusher, and then that would load into the concentrator and mill. And uh, I just myself really love this kind of vernacular architecture of the uh, mine yards, you know, all the mill buildings and uh, covered runways and things. It just seems kind of all thrown together as quickly as possible, even though I'm sure these are, this is quality work being done by these carpenters. It just looked like a mad rush to develop this thing to get the rock out of the ground and make money when zinc was high. Um, over here, you can kind of barely see it. This guy's dangling off the side. So I'm just saying here. It just makes me nervous. <laughs> and, and it's a little late. Yeah, I know. I know these guys are dead and gone, but I'm sure they were fine. 
Um, anyway, each one of these photos just really, I think, details how much work was going into the building of, of this concentrator, and they had an army of guys working on it. Um, and that's another thing Leva did, was take a great photo of the Carpenter crew at the Black Rock. And uh, this is one of those ones that, well, these pictures, I think, is just such, so rich in detail, and it's so clear that, uh, and it's printed in a large format down in the first floor lobby. And you can really, just for a long time, oh, look yeah. at this. Yeah, so the, I assume this guy is maybe the foreman or a boss and his kitty, <laughs> which is really fun. And there's just such visible camaraderie and fraternity on display, like the way these guys are embracing each other. And um, there, I think this is a father and son right here, or maybe father and grandson. But this kid looks so boyish, she must be like 15 years old. Um, and then, you know, there's just lots of neat little details. I think some guys maybe had a wife at home and were better taken care of than like this guy who's like rags. <laughs> and his boots are all tore up. Um, but it couldn't have been easy work. Everything sawn by hand, fastened by hand at this were, time. Were any of these identified? Did they identify any of you? Boys? We haven't. Yeah, I guess we also haven't made an effort to. I mean, they didn't have any name on the photos or anything? Nothing on the photo. Nothing that is awesome. Yeah, no, they're great pictures. I love these. Yeah, so quite the crew working on the Black Rock. And again, this is probably the winter 1911-1912. Um, so yeah, I don't see a lot of gloves. Is that a church in the background? I think it's a power pole oh. right there. But I don't know. Maybe it's a sign from Gad. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I, I can see it a little better close up of my computer and I see some insulators there, so I think it's a power pole. <clears throat> um, so anyway, that's the carpentry crew. So here's another angle. This is kind of uh, west, northwest facing angle of the Black Rock. And um, <clears throat> there was a creek running in this ravine here that came down. That was the source of water for the mill and everything. And I think I have some factoids about that in a bit. But uh, one of the things that strikes me about this photo is just the all the adjacent mines working. So, like everywhere you look on the horizon, there are other head frames and other mining operations. And I think, you know, we all know they used to mine in Butte. Um, but <laughs> it, it really is staggering just how many of these major operations were just adjacent to each other, all operating at the same time. So I don't know, this picture to me, also considering that this is much further north than most of the rest of the mining camp. Um, there was still just so much activity and mineralization that far north that it necessitated all this development. <clears throat> so um, I, I just think this is a great picture. If you think about the uh, camera you would have had to use in order to take a photo on an 8 inch by 10 inch glass plate negative, if, uh, if Leva was putting some work in, <laughs> hiking up to nearby locations um, to take all these pictures. So. This one is clearly from some other adjacent operation. Um, and I think he was probably contracted by the Butte and Superior Company to take these pictures, so it's probably a paid job for him. So then, yeah, this one is kind of north, <coughs> the bottom of the hill. A couple of interesting things about this photo, where you can see all the covered runways that come from the bottom of the mill building that would be conveying zinc concentrates to these bins here that would then be loaded into the train and taken to the smelter. And um, they had these overflow tanks for where all the flotation units and that, and they built these really crazy steep flumes that would take overflow water and just dump it into the creek. And then there's another one down there. Um, and you can barely see it. I don't think you're going to be able to, but there is a guy standing right there. And so he's if he's six feet tall, those tanks are probably 18 feet tall. <coughs> and just the enormity of the operation, I think, is what these pictures convey. And I don't quite know why, but most of the mine yard is just a complete mess with just piles of stuff everywhere all the time. And maybe it was because construction had been relatively recent. But even just getting around on this mine property looks like it would have been exhausting to me. So again, just a massive operation. And the, the initial construction of the mill building did not include this two-story addition that's on the, in the middle of it there. So like I say, that 
this, this facility was always changing and evolving and growing um, until, uh, again, it closed in 1930. So, um, I wanted to take a little bit of time and look at the Sanborn maps. And um, for those of you, of you that are familiar with them, you'll know they're just a wealth of information. And we could probably spend an entire presentation on just the Sanborn map, but that might be a little boring by the end. But um, so, Sanborn Fire Insurance Company put this map together in 1916, and it details the Black Rock, uh, the Butte and Superior Copper Company's Black Rock Mine and Concentrator. And so I wanted to start at the top of the, of the Sanborn map, if I can zoom in. Okay. So one of the things I wanted to kind of highlight, um, you see here they talk about, this is a hundred, do you need some water? I can get you some water. You get, okay. Um, this is a 103,000 gallon steel water tank. And basically, this thing supplies, uh, has nothing to do with the processing of the ore, but is all for their sprinkler system. And so they have this massive uh, fire suppression system, sprinkler hmm. system throughout all their buildings. My guess is because when William Clark and a couple other guys first started developing this claim, they sunk a shaft 400 feet, they built a head frame in a couple buildings, and it all burned down and they weren't insured. <laughs> and so I think after that, they're like, okay, we're not going through that again, um, even though it was under new ownership at this time. So they built this massive system. So I just wanted to kind of follow this. This is a 10 inch water pipe, so you can imagine the pressure coming out of this thing. So it's this dashed line here, and it, it shoots off and goes to all these other buildings. It often, it, they reduce the pipe size to enter into a building. Here the carpenter shop has a six inch water pipe coming to it, and this AS is uh, automatic sprinkler. So I, I'm assuming that it, it would detect fire and then automatically kick on. So the water pipe is coming down here, it's coming down, it goes over here, past all the head frame and everything else. It comes over here and turns to an eight inch pipe. So now it's an eight inch pipe and it comes down here. And this is where it starts entering the concentrator building. And you can see here they have this uh, one and a half inch hydro with a hundred foot hose, they have those like about every 30 feet. And then this eight inch water line comes into the building here, and here, and go down, and here, and here. All throughout the concentrator building is just sprinkled to no end. And if you uh, will look over here at this summary of the operation by the Sanborn Company, you can see here buildings that have the wet system for the sprinkler system. The concentrator had almost 2,000 sprinkler heads in it. Wow. And it's just massive. Uh, and then they also had the dry system, so the carpenter shop, all these other buildings. So total wet sprinkler heads on the site, 2,354. And so they really did not want this place to burn down. Um, these, these are some, I think, really fascinating details, too, that the Sanborn Company gives you about the Black Rock. So um, they have hour, hourly rounds from their watchmen. Power is steam and electric. Uh, heat is steam, lights electric, fuel is coal. City washer, city water pressure at the time you grew up, 135 pounds. Um, this is kind of neat too. The entire premise is surrounded by a 10 foot board fence, which is visible in some of the photos too. I mean, just the lumber for the fencing alone would have been you know, an enormous amount. But, um, and then it kind of gives you the rundown on all the sprinklers. And so if we, if we zoom out again, we'll just kind of move around the Sanborn map, go up here. And uh, in that picture where you can see the big black flume coming out, or the plume of smoke coming out, I'm assuming it's coming from the boilers here, um, which are providing the steam for the heating system. Here's the hoisting, the hoist house, 1500 horsepower engine in it, and then the steel gallus frame. I think it died, Kim. Did we run out of batteries? Okay. I'll project. Does that work? Yeah, <laughs> that works. Okay. I might go get you some batteries, though, Sounds just, good. just for this, too. Sounds good. Actually, um, I think I have some in here. Oh, cool. Appreciate it. We'll do a quick changeover. This is great because I was afraid I'd run short on time anyways. So. <laughs> so Clark, did they ever have to use that suppression, that fire suppression system that you know of? I didn't find After any. all that time and money. And right. I didn't find any articles about it. Murphy's um, Law, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I can tell you for sure it didn't burn down. So <laughs> Maybe they did use it. 
there were small fires. Thanks very much. There were some small fires towards the end of the lifespan of this uh, Butte and Superior company before they sold out to the Honda company in 1940. But uh, nothing major. And most of the buildings were salvaged and just disassembled, is what I've been able to determine. Oh, Mary Christ. Okay, let's go back. Okay, are we good? Yep. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, so here's the gals frame, the ore bin, and then uh, get my pointer going here. There's the crusher. So, you know, they hoist it out, goes to the ore bin, goes to the crusher, goes up this covered uh, runway, the conveyor, which is, by the way, not sprinkler, and then uh, to that tower, which we saw which is 52 feet tall, it says there, mm -hmm. steel ore bin, and then that goes into the secondary crusher, and then through another series of trams to the <coughs> concentrator. And so here, here, yeah, so at the top, that would be the basically northwest end of that big concentrator building. It tells you that wall was 45 feet tall. That's from the ground to the <laughs> um, And then it's angled downward, because this is all gravity-fed system. And then at the bottom is 30 feet tall from the ground. So that gives you an idea of how high those guys are standing on all those timbers when they're building the place. And then, of course, the settling tanks. And anyway, the sand bore map, I think, like I said, just details uh, all of the very particular aspects of this operation in, in such a fascinating way. And I just love, I love sand bore maps myself. And this particular one is a scan. Um, for the Library of Congress, all of these are on the Library of Congress website. But of course, we have the physical books here at the archives. And so, if you ever have a free afternoon and are curious, I, I highly recommend looking through Sanborns because they're just a wealth of information and they're really fun to look at. So, um, a lot of stuff going on in this operation. They had their own carpenter shop where they did timber framing, warehouse, machine shop. Here's the blacksmith shop. And of course, the color coding indicates different building materials, yellow being framed building wood, and then this is cement with steel, um, and then in between these two buildings here, right there, is a brick wall. I think it's, it's saying it's eight inches thick, and then this is a steel door that opens both ways, and that's between the machine shop and the blacksmith shop. Um, the rope house, change house, of course the hoist house, boilers, office compressor building. There were also these kind of outlying uh, shafts, and here's a wooden gallows frame, not used, it says there. I'm thinking that that was on the Elmore Loop property. I did, did a little bit of reading about that yesterday. And then in here you can see also there were plans for another steel gallows frame to be erected, which in fact it was. There were three shafts, like I say, on this property eventually. And here's the wood gallows frame to be erected. Hmm. Um, so in 1916, you know, in the middle of World War I, this place was really booming and they were pumping out a lot of things, so they were constantly expanding. But then, like I say, it all just went away. Um, and there's a 1924, I believe it is, Sanborn, and they just taped a piece of paper over this because the mill building had been dis disassembled by that time. <clears throat> so within a short time of when this drawing was made, a lot of this stuff went away. Um, but we can go on and on about the Sanborn, but anyway, I, I highly recommend coming up and taking a look at the actual map which we have here at the archives. And so that's a bit about uh, the layout of, of all the mine buildings and the operation. So what was it all for? Um, really, zinc. And you need zinc to make brass. You need brass to fight a war. You need a war when you don't have good diplomatic skills, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, this is that secondary crusher tower, which I just, I just am fascinated by that uh, architectural design. It's just entirely functional. But this, I think, also gives kind of the impression of how tall this place was, uh, especially if you're standing downhill. And this is what I'm wondering about, and maybe someone who's here who's spent more time on the mining landscape today by Yankee Doodle could tell me, I mean, these massive concrete walls and all of this uh, footings and walls supporting the concentrator building. Are they buried? Do, do they poke out from the ground nowadays out there? Can, is there any remnant of them left? Uh, that's what I'm curious about. 
or they've simply been buried under the lanes of the It's all buried. Okay. So yeah, where is that in relation to the Granite Mountain? I mean, it's really close. Right, right over there. And you're, if you're at the Granite Mountain, you're yeah. looking down in a, in a hole to, yeah. the, to the collar of the Granite Mountain. So right. It's I'm all sure buried. all that's really buried. It's all buried. So really, it was all about zinc. And uh, this is uh, from a great newspaper article during this 1920 out. And so they talk about, now this one is tons. So 3.4 million tons of ore they pulled out, and that resulted in just a little bit of zinc, a billion pounds, um, and then, by the way, 21 million ounces of silver. Um, so massive operation, and in fact, it was the nation's leading zinc producer in, during World War I, and thereby the, the world leader. Uh, so. Well, Clark, what with the zinc, I'm just curious, you know, what, what, back then, yeah. at that time, what, were, what was zinc so needed? For brass, for the war. That was for the brass. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, for brass to make shell casings. Uh, but it has many other applications too, like, like with the help of Dick Gibson and some folks at the uh, Montana Tech Mineral Museum and the Bureau, we have a little display out there in the exhibit that just talks about the minerals themselves. And so zinc is still the world's fourth most used metal and uh, has a lot of different applications. So, yeah, it's, it's still a really important aspect of industrialized society today, so, but there was, there was quite a bit of it uh, up there in the Black Rock, so. Okay, this is uh, one of those PowerPoint slides that is far too much text, and um, so I'll just read it all. <laughs> um, but still, it's kind of neat, I kind of put together a fact sheet as I found interesting things about the mine. This one was kind of neat, the first one that, um, Every month in Butte, 1913, they're putting out 26 million pounds of copper. That's from all the mines combined. Well, Black Rock was producing half of that in zinc every month by themselves. Um, so, like I say, they consume roughly one million board feet of timber every month. Um, at, at, that's at its peak. Um, 102,000 feet of drift raises and shafts have been developed in just that time period there. So 20 miles of underground excavation. And then uh, they talk about how the, you know, it's called the Black Rock partially because um, the ore itself is so dark that sphalerite, which we have a sample of out in the lobby there. And, um, but the ore deposits that they talk about in this mine are just staggering. 60 feet wide, 20% zinc. So uh, pretty amazing. There were indications too in the newspaper articles of or deposits that were doubled that, 120 feet wide underground. So they were pretty excited when they came into those. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the human cost of our industrialized society. And people don't just die in the wars we fight, but also in, in acquiring the metals that we use to fight those wars. This um, is this really neat thing called the accident accidentometer or accident o -meter. <laughs> and um, this was kind of a really interesting thing to learn about. This is a paper representation of something that was uh, on the front of the Rialto Theater, where U.S. Bank is today, at Parker, Maine. They put up these tubes where they would add colored liquid for each mine, depending on how many injuries they got during a certain period of time in 1920. I think it started in the summer and went through the end of the year. And so anytime there was an accident at a mine, they would add a little bit of colored liquid to this tube that was visible from the street, and it was like this contest for worker safety. And uh, I really, I haven't seen a picture of the accidentometer on the Rialto, but I'd really like to. And uh, anyway, this is a newspaper representation of it, and you can see here the Black Rock is doing pretty good. There's not a lot of accidents by comparison to, say, the Pittsmont, which is like off the chart. Mm -hmm. I don't know what was going on there that year. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind that compared to other mines, the Black Rock was kind of on the lower tier of injuries and deaths. And uh, despite that, there were some really terrible accidents that took place at the Black Rock. I wanted to highlight a couple of them. This is the, this is the one, this thing. Is it me? I think it's you. Is it me? It's you. It's all right Always. Okay. This is the one that really <laughs> caught my attention. And, um, we dedicated a portion of the exhibit just to this one accident, which took oh. place September of 1911. And so, forgive me if this is a, a 
too graphic. It's not for the faint of heart, but I think it's important to remember. Um, so six guys were killed while they were being lifted in the Black Rock shaft. And there are their names there, Charles Green, Leo Chevrier, Patrick O'Neill, Daniel Sheehan, Jamie Lee, and, and Daniel Shea. And so basically what had happened in, in, in the next slide, I'll read a little bit of the newspaper article, but they were riding up the cage with the drill steels in the cage with them, which was against the law. You're not supposed to do that. And somehow one of the drill steels, uh, which the ones they were carrying were seven feet long, dislodged and caught in the side of the shaft as the cage is going up. And so they were they were riding up with like 125 of these drill steels. And when one of them caught in the shaft, it broke the chain and the rest of them broke loose and they swung around in this hurricane that basically uh, chopped these guys all to pieces. And then they all fell down the shaft 1,300 feet into the sun. And then the mine boss and the, the shift boss and the foreman went down and picked up the pieces and blankets. And so it talks about here, I'll just read a little bit of it. I just think the writing of the time <coughs> too is so vivid and, and uh, markedly different from journalism of today. Um, so, caught in a vortex of whirling machine steel drills, five miners met instant death in the shaft of the Black Rock Mine at Butte Superior at 3.15 yesterday, yesterday morning. In their anxiety to reach the surface, the workmen boarded the cage upon which dull steel was being taken to the surface. It's presumed that in their crowding, the men dislodged the drills from the box in which they were held, and they were caught in the wall plates on the side of the 400 foot level, clearing the deck of the miners and sweeping them into the sun 1,300 feet below. Charles Green, station tender, was forced from the upper deck to the lower deck by the force of the impact. When the brakes were applied, it was decapitated, as were all the other unfortunates, with the exception of Lee, and his head was mashed to a pulp. Um, so just a terrible accident. And uh, like I say, downstairs, if you look in the case, there's a lot more detail. And this was covered all around the state, and so we included some uh, newspaper articles from Conrad and from Great Falls where they covered this event. It was really a tragedy and, uh, and a shame. So just a couple other uh, uh, injuries or accidents that I wanted to touch on. It, it was, there were a lot of them. Um, when I started to compile a list, uh, you know, the World Museum of Mining has a pretty comprehensive list of every guy who was killed in the Butte Mines, listed by mine, organized by mine. Um, but I also wanted to include people who were injured seriously also. So. My list thing is pretty comprehensive, although as I was preparing for this presentation, I immediately found one that I missed. So uh, there may be more. Anyway, this is an example of a lot of fractured skulls from falling rocks. So, you know, cave in, he didn't bar down, I guess. Well, this one says here, um, yeah, the, they were going through the shaft and a piece of rock fell down the shaft and hit him in the head. So that's how that guy got it. Um, this one, a guy was Marshal Stewart, was dragged into the conveyor belt, um, being whirled along by a conveyor belt, proved fatal last night to Marshal Stewart, age 48, who was killed almost instantly. And um, the children include three boys and three daughters. It's just sad. Another miner killed at the Black Rock by a fall of ground on the 1900 foot level. Um, his partner was slightly injured, survived by his wife and a daughter and two brothers broken back, ends in miner's death. Um, so yeah, this guy was caught in a fall of rock, age 41, <laughs> died in a local hospital a couple days later. Um, yep, gassed, died. His death occurred while he's being carried from the ambulance. So then um, the list goes on and on and on, and so I just wanted to share that list, which I put together over the course of about two weeks, working on this off and on for the exhibit. So I don't know if you can really read these, but I'll just kind of scroll, scroll slowly to get an idea of how many guys either died or were seriously injured in the Black Rock Mine. And this is your list? Uh-huh. Yeah. A lot of electrocutions. A lot in 1917. Yeah. Like yeah, that increased production, probably. Pressure was on. <clears throat> yeah, that's what I was wondering. 
Was this connected to the, the Granite Mountain speculator? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Jim or Joe. I don't know the answer. Research project, Joe. Yeah, there yeah. we go. <laughs> so I need another one. That's probably in one of the books. I don't know if I should have included this one because this guy was a shit boss who had a heart attack while eating lunch. <laughs> Does that count? He's on the premises. <laughs> I'm going to count it. Um, okay. So, who owned this thing? Um, this was the guy right here, Captain Wolven. And uh, I'm sure there are books about him, and I didn't spend as much time as I would like learning about him. But he was an interesting character. He was from Duluth, and um, he was a ship captain. His dad was in the shipping business on the Great Lakes, and then he inherited that business, and then invested in this mining operation in Montana. He got a lot of other holdings, too, and was, you know, a capitalist, the Gilded Age. And um, so Captain Wolven really was the, he was the president of the Butte and Superior Copper Company. And um, this is a little bit about him, and there's an article downstairs. This picture's kind of dark, but he's a bald guy, and you can't really see him. There's more information about the company uh, downstairs in the exhibit there. So yeah, Butte and Superior operated in Blackrock. And originally, though, it was a William Clark venture, and he sunk the shaft. Um, a guy, Henry Clark, located the original claim. I'm not quite sure if they're related. Anybody know? Henry Clark, Henry S. Clark and William Clark. I'm not sure. I don't think they're related, but for some reason I think they're they're not. They're not but I I, right. I could be wrong. I need so, to look. Yeah. I could. Too many Clarks in our files. Exactly. I yeah. can't quite determine that. The, the claim was originally located by Henry Clark. William Clark financed the shaft, um, and then he bought out his partners for fifty thousand dollars cash in 1905, and then the next year he was provided an undisclosed sum sum of stock. Uh, and then the Butte and Superior Company bought it. So then they entered into a contract with the American Metals Company in 1909, and that's really what spurred the construction of that mill that we were looking at earlier. Prior to that, they had shipped their um, ore to Basin to be concentrated there, or process treated there, um, but then they built their own operation and didn't have to ship it there anymore, so they saved money that way. And um, so then, yeah, like I say, the Butte and Superior suspended operations in November of 1930, Basically, the price of zinc or spelter fell uh, to a point where it was no longer economical. And like many of the other predominantly zinc mines in Butte, they closed. And then the claim was sold to the Anaconda Company in 1940. But by that time, a lot of the buildings were gone. So this is a newspaper article from that November 1930. Um, and it talks over here in this part of it about how, uh, let's see here, where, oh yeah, so these men will not be laid off at present time, but be engaged in salvaging property of the mine, this work will entail considerable labor over quite a period. Indeed, to take apart those massive buildings. Um, so this really was the end of the Black Rock, and then uh, it was for sale in the newspaper. Use bricks. <laughs> Excellent condition. Um, so they, were, they sold it all off, and then the buildings were disbanded. So um, to kind of close out here, I'll just touch on a couple other little notable facts about the Black Rock that don't have to do specifically with the minerals. Um, they had their own baseball team. They actually had their own hockey team too. And uh, the Black Rocks were a team within the Butte Mines League, which was a really fascinating segment of Butte history to look into. And hard to believe really that it existed because um, you can't really catch a game in Butte these days. But the, when the Butte Mines League was going, they had three games a week uh, on weeknights and then a doubleheader every Sunday, and it was all free. Um, and they had, at, at the peak, there were seven teams that participated. The Black Rocks were one of them. And so this is a Leva photo, and another one of those ones that's really fun just to examine. All the looks on their faces, and this guy's kind of toothless grin. And I, I wonder, like, who is the pitcher? He's the catcher. Yeah, he's got to be the catcher. I think this is the pitcher, and I think he's the catcher. Um, but anyway, and their shoes are really cool. They're not visible in the spray. But so were they just ball players, or were they miners? Yeah. And then when they got off shift, they went and they played ball three days a week. Right. So that part of the thing, good question. That part is detailed in a case in the first floor of the exhibit. So in order to play in the Butte Mines League on a team for a Butte Mine, you have to work at that mine. 
And so these guys worked at the mine. They might be carpenters or miners or whatever, but they were employed by Butte Superior and had to be, to be on the team. Except in the final couple seasons of the Butte Mines League, they allowed each team to have three guys that were not. Three ringers. <laughs> yeah, three ringers, yeah. <laughs> so they started hiring these guys that later would go on to play for the Yankees or the Pirates. And so there were some, by the end of it, really good players in the Butte Mines League. And um, they would get paid for their time doing baseball, too. And we actually have a, a document downstairs uh, detailing what they got paid, what hourly rate, and how many hours a month these guys were playing baseball and company time. So it was kind of neat. And um, so like I say, yeah, the Mines League was formed in 1918. And uh, the Black Rocks, even though they're my team, man, uh, they weren't that good. <laughs> so they were often in the bottom tier of the league standings. Um, but like I say, the Butte Mines League had some really good players, including this kid, Gordon Rhodes, who's interesting if you look him up, and he went on to play for the Yankees. Um, and the Butte Mines League ran for 10 years, and then the final season was in 1927. And so there were baseball fields at Columbia Gardens, Wanameterville, Timber Butte, uh, and Happy Park on East Second Street. So pretty cool. Uh, and the Black Rocks, yeah, the baseball team. So this is the time they played Gonzaga. And then I don't think I included it in this, but there was a time there was an ad for and an article for a time that they played an all-black team from Chicago and scored no runs. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of neat. And um, I just love the language, again, the journalism of the day. Tim Review is hopelessly skinned. <laughs> the Black Rock Pill Tossers in a riotous slam fest. <laughs> and down here, too, it's really funny. Uh, the Black Rocks invaded Timber Butte and came home with the bacon, singing a chant of victory to the tune of 14 to 3. <laughs> so good. Um, so, okay, that's the baseball team. And then for the final little bit here, other notable facts. These fantastic photos that we have uh, that are on display in the exhibit, and including that photo of the baseball team, were taken by this man right here. And that's Clemente Leva and his family, and they lived in Walkerville. And Clem was a really interesting character. We did some research on him, and you know, of course, he still has family in town to this day. <coughs> Bob Leva is, uh, is his grandson. And so the bulk of the images were taken 1911, 1912. And Clemente Leva was an Italian immigrant. Um, he arrived in Montana in 1900. They lived on Blue Wing in, in Walkerville, and that's where they made their life. He was a member of the Christopher Colombo Society, worked as a watchman at the Badger, and then they rented boarders, rented rooms to boarders, and he played accordion in local bands. And so we have about 1,200 of these glass plate negatives that have been processed so far. Um, and I just, if you get a chance to look at the Leva collection, he really has an interesting eye. And uh, I put here, they, it, a lot of his photos have this humorous tilt and understated candor. So what I mean by that is, uh, I think Smithers is great too, but Leva, it's like, it won't be a family portrait just of people sitting on the front steps. It'll be like someone sitting in a tree with a violin and someone with a bottle wine <laughs> like this, you know, like <clears throat> lots of neat little details that are just hilarious. And uh, I have to think that the photographer was kind of staging those things a little bit. So, Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> this is just getting ridiculous. Okay, I'm gonna glue it to myself. <clears throat> so then, yeah, Clem died on uh, March 15th, 1936. Uh, temperatures in Elk Park that winter were like negative 55. Uh, he got pneumonia, and he had just, like a month previous, helped fight the fire at the old St. Lawrence School. So my guess is that he fought this fire, maybe a lot of smoke inhalation, and it was so cold, and then he got pneumonia, and that's what, that's what took him out. But, um, anyway, he left a great legacy in all of his many photographs. So, um, any questions or comments? Very good. Great. Um,